Howdy folks and welcome back to the final part of the video of my visit to the United States Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, USA. For today's video we had a guided tour towards the end of the second day of the restoration hangar where all kinds of vehicles in various different states of disrepair are being worked on before they can put on display in the main display hangars. Unfortunately, the restoration hangar is an incredibly noisy environment and there were air compressors being fired up, diesel generators running. It just wasn't possible to adequately record the commentary provided by our lovely guide, Sue, who has probably forgotten more about the various aircraft on display at the museum than most of us will ever know. Wherever possible, I've tried to present her commentary live, but the amount of background noise that was in effect during the course of this guided tour has just made that impossible uh, throughout large parts of this video so instead wherever the background noise was too loud and uh, and I can't let you hear what Sue was actually telling us herself um, I'm basically translating for her and doing a post commentary trying to salvage what I could from the audio throughout this video so my apologies in advance for that and my apologies to Sue who was a fantastic guide and an absolute wealth of knowledge and information about all the various different vehicles and aircraft that they're working on in this restoration hangar. So, on with the tour. The first thing that we saw when we entered the restoration hangar was this collection of tubes. Apparently you put all of these together and you get one of these. It's the Titan IV rocket system, launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base and used by the US Air Force to put their satellites into orbit. Developed from the Titan I and II family, of intercontinental ballistic missiles. The Titan IV was never used to deliver nuclear warheads, it was purely a rocket booster system used to put things into orbit. Titan IV was retired from service in 2005 and replaced by the Delta rocket system. Interestingly, Delta is actually based on an even earlier ICBM system than Titan was, based on the Thor missile system. It's one major advantage over the Titan is that it doesn't cost more than $400 million every time you put one of these things into orbit. This is an Atlas missile. And Atlas missiles have to be under pressure. This is under pressure. You see the little bridge carrying the, the hose? Mm. That's the pressure line and that gauge better look like that all the time. <laughs> right there. The Atlas missile, just a quick history of the system, was our first truly intercontinental missile. Prior to this, you had the Jupiters, which could only be launched from Turkey to reach the Soviet Union, and you had the Titans, which could only which had to be in Germany to reach the Soviet Union. Those are called intermediate range ballistic missiles or IRBMs. The Atlas would be our first intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, it's not in a silo, it has to be on the surface, and to reduce the weight of it, it has no internal structure. So it must be under pressure, and there's a special process you do to fuel it and keep it in, in shape. Um, the atlases would also be used to launch the Mercury uh, in, in the per Mercury program. Right. John Glenn would be the first person to ride to the space for an Atlas missile. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom went up on redstones. And one of the things, if you've never done it, you might want it, it's a fun thing to look at, is go find a picture that shows all the manned space launch missiles. Redstone, um, you know, basically hold just a candle to <laughs> the mighty Saturn V. <laughs> and I'll come to where the liaisons now fit into it. It's going to start with this girl, this Douglas O-46. Right. This is a late 20s, early 30s design aircraft. It is a monoplane. But by the time World War II came about, almost all but, I think, one of our observation aircraft were considered too old and obsolete for any type of war service because they were too, couldn't fly high enough or fast enough to be safe. This is also the last O, where O meant observation and nothing else. Now, we've now canceled 
and I'll come back to the history of this in a minute, but to finish off the rest of the other questions. Kind of hard to do this, to get both sides of this thing in there right together. They, you now have basically no observation aircraft. <laughs> so what are you going to do? This is where you start doing what is just euphemistically referred to as buying off the shelf. What that means, it doesn't mean that you're just going to go to the civilian manufacturers and say, well, I want this, this, and this. You're going to go and talk to them and look at their stuff to see what you can easily modify for military use. Um, if you go back to the museum and you look, go down where the training aircraft are in the World War II gallery, off to the left, it's our L4 Grasshopper. That's a Piper Cup. Modification made for that was to basically double the pumps and blast down the side. Okay, so you're looking for simple modifications at this time. Um, the, in terms of, from 1942 through today, any claim that is labeled L for liaison, O for observation, or U for utility, those are the categories where you can hide the mission of the aircraft. For the L's and the O's, the heyday for the L's and the O's is Vietnam. And some of those missions are still classified and will probably remain classified. Now today, we don't fly any L's, we do fly two U's, and the most famous of the U's is U2. <laughs> UH. Well, that's the other one, but the U2 is the most famous. <laughs> the, and of course, that's not a utility airplane. We know what the U2 is. <laughs> it's a, Pardon? It's a utility observation aircraft. Yes, it's a spy plane. <laughs> Unfortunately, somebody decided it was a good idea to start up an air compressor right next to us for this next part, so the audio component was completely ruined. Which means you're going to have to settle for me translating for the lovely Sue while we take a look at this MiG-23 flogger. It was basically Russia's answer to the F-4 Phantom, although there were substantial differences. It was single-seater, single-engine, and swing-wing. You can see there the hinge in the wing roots with the hydraulic system which allowed the wings to be set for 16 degrees for takeoff, landing, and low speed cruise, 45 degrees for high speed cruise, and 72 degrees for combat. Now, when we say that the MiG 23 was Russia's answer to the Phantom, it's probably safe to say that it was heavily influenced by the design of the Phantom, unlike the MiG 15, MiG 17, MiG 19, and MiG 21, and just like the F 4 Phantom, the air intakes for the engine were at the side of the fuselage rather than mounted in the nose. And the reason for this was because the MiG-23 was the first Soviet fighter aircraft to feature a very powerful nose-mounted radar. A bit like the Phantom. And the similarities don't just end there. If you look at the air intake ramps at the front of the engine intakes, they're practically a direct copy of the variable intake ramps on the F-4 Phantom. The purpose of these was to regulate the airflow into the engines, depending on the speed that the aircraft was travelling at and they work in exactly the same way on the MiG-23 as they did on the F-4 Phantom. Of course, it's not fair to just write the MiG-23 off as a Russian copy of the F-4 Phantom. It, it wasn't. It was heavily influenced by the design of the F-4 Phantom, but it was very much its own aircraft. It was distinctly different in a number of areas. One being that it just didn't work very well. <laughs> it was your typical Russian design philosophy of just get the thing into the air, and then we'll worry about making it fly properly. Arguably more so on the MiG-23 than on any previous Russian fighter aircraft because it was such a huge step forward in design philosophy, incorporating elements that had never been tried before on a Russian fighter aircraft. It was the first truly modern Russian jet fighter. And for those of you who got all excited when you saw the big white rusty rocket sitting next to the MiG-23, yes, that is an honest-to-goodness V-2. What surprised me about the V2 is how small it is. It's less than half the size of the MiG-23 that it's parked next to. You always just assume that these things were much, much bigger than they really are. That's Why got to be an Iraqi MiG-25. It's a MiG-25 Fox Pact. Oh yes. Huge. Okay, you probably recognize the tail. <laughs> MiG-25 Iraqi. MiG-25, yes, Iraqi MiG-25. This is a sand rat that came out of a dune. <laughs> what you can see here are components of the V1 flying bomb, which, contrary to popular belief, was a pulse jet, not a rocket. You could hear this thing coming at night from 10 miles away, and the engine plume was like a beacon. Actually spotting the things was not difficult. Shooting them down was. Initially, the only aircraft that the Royal Air Force had fast enough to catch a V1 was the Hawker Tempest. Problem? 
was that shooting them down with 20mm cannons required you to get so close that destroying the V-1 could also destroy the aircraft that shot it down in the blast. Eventually the Tempest pilots came up with a hair-raising tactic of actually flying so close to the V-1 that they would position their wings within six inches of the stabilizing fins of the V-1, disrupting the airflow and sending it into an uncontrolled crash. If any of you play the air combat simulator War Thunder, there's actually a custom battle event in the game where you can do this. Rather them than me. But finally we come to what for me, and probably for a lot of you, was the highlight of the visit to the restoration hangar. The museum has three World War II veteran B-17s. One is on display to the public, two are being worked on for restoration, and one of them is the actual Memphis Bell. Um, the B-17 project started as a design project and for Boeing in 1934. The prototype flew in July of 1935 and then crashed right outside this building in October of 1935. It was most probably human failure, it's possibly part failure, but what's most important, it was not design failure. But, too bad, Congress still make a long story short, Congress pretty much just said, you're playing crash, can't have it. By the VA team, which is a bomber, is a truly awful airplane. Cap Arnold, who was leading the push for the better, bigger and better bombers, got them to approve a test program with 13 airframes. From those 13 airframes, the US B-17 fleet would be born. However, by 1939, the year the war started in Europe, we owned exactly 39 B-17s. The British had purchased some sea models. They would be the first to take them into combat in the early days of the war. The sea model was badly underarmed. They tried daylight raids without fighter support to disastrous results. Our first use of the B-17s would be in the Philippines in December of 1941. Our big, big push with the B-17s would start halfway through 1942 in Europe with the F-Mops. Approximately 12,000 B-17s saw combat in some way you know, during the war. Approximately half of those were lost in some way during the war. Today, there are only three known battle veterans left. I usually read the newspaper, well, somebody's got one and they think the numbers are gonna match. Guess what, no. Right now, this museum, and for a number, good number of years yet, this museum is in possession of all three battle veterans. We have the G model, Shusha Baby, in the museum. You are standing by the most famous, the F model, Memphis Bell. And the oldest surviving B-17, the Sluice, is in the middle hangar. That was in the Philippines in December of 1941. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, now, to the, G, the F models and the history of Memphis Bell. The F models themselves is estimated between 75 and 80 percent of those were lost in some way during the war. The plane is a death trap because the nose is badly underarmed, and we'll see pictures of that. The Air Corps knew, all right, we had to bomb the daylights out of German industry and military fields. We had to break their back. This needed the big bombers. But how do you sell that to the bill payer Congress and the young men you need to recruit? because you did not get drafted into the Air Corps, you enlisted. How do you sell it when the loss is that high? Well, they noticed that two B-17s were not being shot down, and they decided that if one of them made it to 25 missions, it could come home on a bond tour. Memphis Bell is not the first to make it to 25. She's the first to make it to 25 and come home, because Hell's Angels made it to 25 first. But they decided, what do you want on a bond tour? A plane named Hell's Angels or one name for a pretty girl. <laughs> Hell's Angels came home after 40, uh, 40 missions. Um, now, there's no crew cohesiveness here, all right? There's, Robert Morgan was the usual pilot of this. The crew of 10, those 10 men did not fly all those missions together. First of all, it took them from November of 42 to May of 43. With the loss rate, you're filling out crews constantly with other people, planes down for repairs. So the airframe had 25 missions, all 10 men had 25 missions. One man flew only the 24th. None of the men who flew the famous 25th came home with the airplane. Uh, with the G model, you get a little more co cohesiveness, but you'll never find where 10 men would fly you know, all those missions together. It just didn't happen. Like that. Uh, now, came on the bond tour for about three or four months around the United States and went to Big Dill uh, in Florida to do bomber training. That's where she stayed until 1946. She was then slated to go to Altus, Oklahoma to be scrapped, which is what happened to Hell's Angels. 
the mayor of Memphis had raised the princely sum of something like $304 to and asked the Air Force if he could have the plane for the city of Memphis. He would let him take the aircraft, but he was not the Memphis Bell Association, never held title to it. That remained with the Air Force. She was the most famous loan for all those years. About 10 or so years ago now, um, well, she was on display in various places around the city of, of Memphis, mostly at the Armory. She was in storage a little bit at the time. In the 1980s, we ordered a fix up, and she had to go undercover. That's when she moved to Mud Island under the tent. She was evicted from Mud Island, went back into storage. The plane was in now in pretty bad shape, even after the shape, even after the 80s fix up. Um, and the Memphis Bell Association and the other organizations that had some, you know, interest in this and the museum finally got together, fairly equitably decided it was time for it to come from here. And she's about halfway through what they estimate today at 10 year restoration project. So, yeah, let's go to the floor. So this has five years to go. The good old Memphis Bell here is about halfway through a 10 year restoration project and we'll see some of the various parts that have been removed and are being worked on separately in a workshop next door later on in the video. And I really should at this point uh, take time to thank our guide, Sue, uh, for the fantastic tour that she gave us of the various different projects and exhibits that are being worked on in the restoration hangar. She's been doing tours like this for something like 30 years now. There isn't much she doesn't know. And not just about the technical facts and figures about all the various different aircraft, but she has all these little nuggets of information. For example, um, you may have seen various B-17s flying at air shows and museums around the world. Not one of them is a World War II combat veteran. The only three remaining World War II combat veteran B-17s in the world are all here at the United States Air Force Museum in Dayton. The Memphis Bell and the Swoos, which are being worked on here in the restoration hangar, and the Shoo Shoo Baby, which is on display to the public in the main viewing hall. I had the great privilege last year of seeing the B-17 Sally B flying at the Imperial War Museum Duxford's Spring Air Show. There's a good chance you've actually seen the Sally B yourself without realising it. Uh, she's appeared in various movies. She played the Memphis Belle in the movie of the same name. She was also the B-17 that crashed at the beginning of Paul Verhoeven's Black Book movie. What I didn't know was that the Sally B flies on four engines loaned to her by the United States Air Force Museum here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Just off to the side of the area where the Memphis Bell has been parked, there is a small workshop where various different pieces have been removed from the aircraft, such as these ball turrets, so that more detailed work can be done to them, including the entire tail gun assembly from the Memphis Bell. The interesting thing about the tail gun assembly is that if you get closer and have a look, you can see various names have been inscribed on it. And it's not just the tail gun assembly, the entire aircraft is covered in these. These names actually date back to the Second World War, on the publicity tour that the Memphis Bell undertook when it was withdrawn from Europe and brought back to the USA, people that went to see the aircraft would actually sign their names on the airframe. And one of the challenges of the restoration project is preserving the skin of the aircraft without removing features like this, which have a huge historical significance. And I do highly recommend that if you ever visit this museum, you get yourself on one of these guided tours, because it's thanks to fantastic tour guides like the lovely Sue here, that we're able to find out this sort of thing, information that you just don't get from walking around looking at static displays. And that's pretty much it for my visit to the restoration hangar at the United States Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. There were a couple of things that I would have loved to have been able to show you, but for security reasons wasn't able to, such as the KC-135 airborne anti-missile laser system which was parked outside the hangar, right in front of the Memphis Bell, unfortunately. We weren't allowed to film anything outside the hangar for security reasons because the restoration hangar is actually inside Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, not in the museum. Coming up next is going to be the video of my visit to the Dayton Air Show, which was the day after my visit to the restoration hangar. We're going to see the Blue Angels. I'm going to get to fly in a Cobra gunship. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, um, I hope to see you uh, for that video. It was a lot of fun. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And I hope you've enjoyed the series of four videos on my visit to the United States Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. As always, take care, folks, and I'll catch you next time.